connection. I'm Mira Rubin here with you on Enlightened World Network. And today's topic is resistance to change. And the one thing that we can count on, the one constant, as you've heard it spoken, the one constant is change. So as we can allow ourselves to experience change without resistance and allow more ease and grace into our lives, uh, our lives will be vastly improved. Uh, anyway, it should be an interesting conversation. Welcome, Rosalind. Good morning. So good to have you here with us. And welcome to everybody else who's joining us. Um, before we get started with our conversation today, let's just take a couple minutes to get present. So let's take a deep breath in through your nose and hold it. And imagine clean, crisp oxygen flooding your lungs, flowing into your bloodstream, nourishing all your cells, all your organs, bringing vital life energy to your body and being. And as you exhale, exhale any tension, stress, negativity, fatigue. And now let's take another deep breath in through your nose and hold it. This time, imagine brilliant bright light, lighting you up from the inside out, illuminating, electrifying, and energizing all your cells, all your molecules, your electrons, creating a brilliant beam of light and energy from your heart out into the world. And as you exhale, exhale any remaining tension, stress, negativity, fatigue. And now let's press our palms together. Vigorously rub your hands together to feel the friction, the temperature, the pressure, the motion, the tickling and tingling when you stop, and allow all those sensations to bring you present right here, right now, into this remarkable physical form that enables us to experience life. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So, resistance to change. This came up yesterday. Um, in a session with someone who is practicing something that I've spoken with you about. I'm, I'm practicing it to the DNRS system, uh, dynamic neuro retraining system. And um, it's working on repatterning the limbic system, which is essentially our fight and flight network. Uh, and it was so such an interesting conversation because one of the things that shows up as part of this program is resistance. And um, the resistance is an interesting thing. You know, it shows up in all different kinds of ways where um, where we, practice avoidance behaviors, we uh, have an internal struggle, we maybe act out, all kinds of things that show up as an expression of resistance. And um, in this case, this person was experiencing a part of themselves that had been um, really focused on they they were calling it their dark side but had been focused on all kinds of negative things in their life in their life uh negative experiences and and um just sort of being in these patterns which we we all have our patterns where we can get caught in a loop sometimes where we'll just uh, go round and round and round with the same idea and work ourselves into more and more of a state uh, through this kind of automatic behavior that just accelerates. So it's um, it's it's a deeply entrenched pattern. And when that pattern gets disrupted, that can be very unsettling right? Because it's unfamiliar. We talk a lot about welcoming the unknown and getting 
comfortable with being uncomfortable and getting comfortable with the uh, the unfamiliar. But th what can happen is that parts of ourselves that are being disrupted may assert themselves <clears throat> in all kinds of ways, like like injury sometimes, or in this particular person's case, weird sleeping patterns where um, they would wake up at a certain hour of the day, like at 3 a.m., and like an alarm clock. And just wake up and that was it. And so this created anxiety for them. And it was a way for this, this part that was um, kind of running the anxiety uh, machine to reassert itself because they were doing really well around the the issue of anxiety they were feeling better they weren't experiencing anxiety and then um this part just sort of reasserted it itself and said okay i'm gonna wake you up at 3 a.m and i'm gonna do that because i know it makes you anxious and that way uh all this all this change can be put to a halt you know the, so it's not that it was even conscious resistance. It's just part of their being that was trying to um, protect them, was trying to protect them from this disruptive change. So this notion of a part of ourselves that creates anxiety being, for instance, a protective element comes from the notion that whatever the behaviors are that we have, even if they're disruptive, even if they're uncomfortable, um, that, that there was initially a positive intention to that behavior. Good morning, good morning, Erica. Welcome. So good to have you joining us. We're talking about resistance to change and how uh, there are parts of ourselves that will assert themselves even in the face of positive change to, um, to protect the status quo, to protect the familiar. And so that's what was happening with this person when, uh, when they would just wake up at 3 a.m. They felt like this was being done to them, you know, like it was something beyond their control and it caused alarm, which was reasserting the pattern that was in the process of being changed, where the anxiety, the pattern of anxiety was being disrupted. And this was a, a way for on an other than conscious level to reassert the anxiety because as uncomfortable and 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 really miserable the anxiety was no matter how much suffering that it had created um it was familiar it was familiar and um i i love this term from one of my clients my favorite miserable um and when we disrupt our favorite miserable even though it needs to be disrupted, even though it's making us miserable, uh, there's a part of ourselves that just really wants to hold on to that. So Erica says, tell me about it. I have, I have anxiety, overwhelmed depression, and can't sleep. I've been up since 4.30 this morning, can't sleep. Well, I can, unfortunately, Erica, I can relate to that. Um, fortunately, since I've been doing this program, I've been doing better, but I was waking up at three in the morning routinely. Um, one of the things that we looked at when we recognized that this, this pattern was happening for this person was what is the meridian that's active at three in the morning? And I think it's three to five 
is the um, the lung meridian, and lung meridian is tied in with grief and sorrow. So that might offer you a clue, Erica. Uh, but I I would suggest with the anxiety and depression, I I would suggest this program check out retrainingthebrain.com it's dnrs dynamic neuro retraining system neural retraining system and um what it talks about is that a lot of the physical as well as emotional or anxiety fear um our upset states, depression, uh, are a function of a dysregulated or or um, dysfunctional limbic system, and that's our system of fight and flight. And so, this program is a essentially a self directed program <clears throat> to retrain the brain. And when we get caught into fight or flight, what happens is our system is on high alert and then everything is perceived as a threat and it can end up spiraling into a worse and worse kind of condition. So the, the thing is that we do have the ability to re, reprogram it. And this program is very much about reconditioning into more positive states to create neural pathways that are tied to positive experience rather than than negative experience, rather than um, the overwhelm, the anxiety, the depression, and oftentimes physiological symptoms of those things. So um, there's a book that's written by the woman who started the DNRS program. Uh, it's called Wired for Healing, I think. Wired for Healing and the author and the founder of this program is Annie Hopper. And she employs neuro-linguistic programming as part of the reprogramming where you find a positive, um, create positive anchors. So uh, like positive memories from the past and positive projections into the future. And you uh, experience those or rehearse those with heightened, heightened emotion, uh, elevated emotion and uh incorporating sensory experience, smells, sights, textures, feelings, uh, sounds, etc. And it, and it, it requires diligent practice. It requires uh, an hour an hour a day of practice, which sounds like a lot. but if you check it out, uh, it's retrainingthebrain.com. And the first two lessons are free. So you can check it out and see if it resonates with you. Talk. The first two lessons are teaching about the limbic system and how it works and, and neuroplasticity and that we really truly can rewire our brain and lots of the symptoms that we experience in our lives, especially some of these mysterious uh, physiological ailments that people can't quite figure out are symptoms of this limbic system dysfunction. So being able to repattern the limbic system is, is super powerful. And people that have had these very complex, mysterious kinds of illnesses have a, a number of them have had really remarkable results through this practice. So I invite you to check it out. But the so the thing is that in the process of change that resistance arises and it takes a 
committed act of will to be able to overcome that resistance. And one of the ways that we can overcome our resistance is through having a very compelling why, having a compelling reason to work through that resistance, that challenge, to retrain ourselves. So maybe not pushing through as much as training our way through, you know, as recognizing, oh, wow, isn't that interesting? Rather than judging the resistance, rather than avoiding the resistance, to face it with curiosity and say, oh, wow, what's going on here? Isn't that interesting? Why is that coming up now? What's that about? And not as something that we need to give into, but as something that we can explore and recognize and deepen our awareness from and deepen our understanding. And so the, the fascinating thing is that this resistance shows up even when the change is positive. Maybe even especially if the change is positive because uh, it, it requires potentially recreating our notion of who we are or what life is about, right? If we're in a really negative state, a, a depressive state, an anxious state, <clears throat> that there's a familiarity to it. And in order to shift it, it means that we're shifting our whole experience of the world as well as our relationship to it, right? And it's unfamiliar. So in many ways, we tend to be creatures of habit. In many ways, we tend to want to maintain the status quo, even at the expense of our well-being, which is kind of fascinating. And recently, we've been talking about logic and uh, the illusion that humans are logical creatures. This is just an example of that. We can't, we can't necessarily logic our way into, into um, making the change that we need to make. So it's not just reasonable or reasonableness, <laughs> or reason that's going to allow us to move into the discomfort of resistance, that's going to allow us to move into the discomfort of change. We have to have a compelling why, and a, and, and a primary component of a compelling why is emotion an emotional connection to why we're doing something the um emotional connection that actually energizes emotion energy in motion so the emotional connection energizes us into a a willingness to move through the resistance, to overcome our resistance, to hold to our greater commitment. But there's there's a driver, there's an emotional attachment or an emotional connection that powers that will to continue to do what it is we are committed to. So No, no amount of reason is going to transform that, right? Without the emotion, without the emotional connection. So a couple ways that we can move through or, or find support in moving through the resistance is one, to have a compelling why and to be able to recreate that for ourselves and the possibility of what 
what is available. Um, that's the another way or another tool to assist us on that path is curiosity rather than judgment. You know, just notice when we're curious rather than judging, we have the ability to look at something straight on without needing to avoid it as much, right? If we can just be curious. So Rosslyn says, activate the heart. Exactly. So we, we are a being that is complex, where there are many intelligences that coordinate to create our greater experience. And in order to understand that intelligence, we tend to try to break it into separate pieces, like body, mind, and spirit, or brain and heart or gut. You know, we 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 try to divide these things out, uh, like like trying to understand a frog by dissecting it. You know, you can understand certain things about the organs, but in the meantime, you're killing the frog. And what we need to remember is that we are this integrated whole. We are not mind alone or heart alone or body alone or spirit alone. You know, that this is this is some kind of complex dynamic that we are. And uh, all of those, all of those um, influences contribute to an integrated experience. And so when we try to separate ourselves out from uh, our emotion or, or our thoughts even, uh, we, it, it can act as a, a powerful tool to be able to isolate different elements, but we need to remember that they are all part of an integrated whole and we get to bring those pieces back together. So um, the will, when activated by the heart, the emotion, and the concept, when we pull, pull all these things, these these seemingly separate elements together, then we can maybe soften that resistance. You know, when, when, when we try to push through something, in pushing, we're, we're kind of creating resistance rather than, than allowing things to... Um, Uh, flow. There's a difference between flow and pushing, right? And so we can better access the flow by employing curiosity, for example. That That is not the same. The curiosity is kind of an invitation rather than an aggression of, of pushing or denying or discarding or um, overpowering, overcoming, that kind of thing. So the curiosity is an invitation. It's an opening. And, and when there's more of an opening, there's more room for flow. So uh, it's, it's an interesting thing to notice, welcome Erica, so good to have you joining us. We're talking about resistance to change and how we can uh, dissolve it, how we can smooth it or soften it to allow ourselves to flow more readily with change. Because we are living in a world of radical change. There is lots and lots and lots of change that we are all 
faced with, that we all contend with. And the sooner we become, the sooner we become more graceful in our response to change, the better off we're all going to be. So that's awesome, Erica. Thank you for finding us. Um, we're great. We're delighted to have you joining us. So look in your in your life, look in your life to notice what kinds of changes are occurring. Notice the the way that resistance might be showing up. We might call that resistance self-sabotage. It might look like that because it's resistance to change. And what we might do is then engage that part that is having that resistance and and just say, hey, what's going on here? You know, what do you need? How can we how can we work on the same team? How can we support each other in going forward? Um, again, what we're doing is going from part to whole, from part to whole. So um, Rosalind says the time change caught up with sleepy cycle now, I think. Um, thank you. And Eric, and thank you for your high praise. Very, very much appreciated. So anyway, that's it for today. I'm Mira Rubin. This is The Core Connection. And I go live here each weekday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern on the Enlightened World Network Facebook page and YouTube channel. And I invite you to follow and like uh, the Enlightened World Network Facebook page and YouTube channel and my YouTube channel. The links are in the description. And as always, I am so deeply grateful to all of you for the opportunity to spend this time together and to muse together about life and uh, what it is to be human. So until next time, so much love to you.